This is Styx, our entry in this year's N64 Homebrew Game Jam. Caitlin G. Cook did the artwork for the game, and Jeff Nichter did the sounds and music. I did the programming and game design. Like most games I try to make, we had much bigger ambitions than we could fit into the jam, and so I had to cut back a lot of content, but I'm still happy with the result. You play as the skeleton, Albert, and fulfill product requests in a warehouse. If you fail to fulfill too many requests, a ghost, based on a certain billionaire, will appear and chase you. If he catches you, it's game over, and you need to start the level over again. There are a few gameplay twists I won't spoil here, but overall the gameplay is pretty simple, nothing too groundbreaking. My main focus on this jam was incorporating tune shading and the shadow techniques that I developed earlier this year. I wanted to see how viable they were for a game. And as far as I know, neither technique has ever been done in an N64 game before. But before I explain how I do tune shading in my game, first we just need to understand how tune shading works. When an object is shaded normally, it has a gradual transition from the unlit part of the surface to a lit part of the surface. Tune shading removes the gradual blend and instead has the unlit stay completely unlit until it crosses a certain threshold, then immediately transitions to be fully lit. This makes the shading appear more flat while allowing the contours of the object to still be visible based on where the transition happens. Implementing tune shading on a modern GPU would involve writing a custom pixel shader, which just means you're writing custom code for the GPU to run for each pixel. This gives total freedom over how a pixel color is calculated. But the N64 doesn't have a programmable pixel pipeline. Instead it has a fixed pipeline that can be configured to achieve certain effects. The part of the N64 responsible for rendering pixels is called the RDP, or Reality Display Processor, and any on-screen effect is limited by what this device is able to do. So in order to achieve tune shading, I had to get creative with my rendering process. The first feature of the RDP I took advantage of for tune shading is using an 8-bit color buffer, which makes each pixel a grayscale value between 0 and 255, where 0 is black and 255 is white. And if I make a light dim enough, I can make it so that the lit part of the object is exactly one shade lighter than the unlit shade. I can also use the ambient lighting value to choose exactly which number the unlit shade has. So, for example, if I use the ambient value of 32 and draw an object, the unlit pixels are drawn as 32, and the fully lit pixels are drawn as 33. The pixel values in between of lit and fully unlit will fall somewhere between 32 and 33, but before it's written to the 8-bit frame buffer, it must be rounded to either 32 or 33. Since there is no value written to the frame buffer between these two values, you get an instant transition between the two shades. The next step is to add color. I do that using color palettes. When a color palette is used, each pixel is a single number in a specified range. Each possible number is then assigned to a corresponding color. So, using a color palette, I can take the 8-bit frame buffer I rendered the scene to and assign one of the 256 possible grayscale values each to its own color. So, for example, if I took 32 and assigned that color to be the unlit red and made 33 lit red, any objects drawn using grayscale values in that range will be comprised of only lit or unlit red, but nothing in between. I can then organize a whole palette of colors when drawing the 8-bit buffer to the screen where each object controls its color by changing the offset into the color palette. For this game, I actually repeat the lit color three times in a row in the palette for reasons I'll explain later. So that's how tune shading works, but how do I do shadows? Well, there are actually a few shadow techniques. To understand how shadows work, first you need to understand how the lighting works. The light being projected onto the ground is drawn by adding 1 to the value in the frame buffer. This changes any unlit pixels to be its corresponding lit pixel. This is also why I have three lit pixels in a row. If a pixel is incremented 2 or even 3 times, it stays the same color. If I didn't do this, then a pixel that was lit twice would jump to the next color in the palette. But before I draw the light, first I draw the shadow. I create the shadow by rendering the player to an off-screen frame buffer from the perspective of the light, but I draw the player as solid white. I then draw the frame buffer over the ground. I use an alpha compare mode that tells the N64 to discard all the black pixels. I also use a render mode that doesn't modify the pixel color but only updates the Z buffer. Since the shadow is closer to the camera than the light projection, it covers up the light underneath it, preventing it from being drawn where the shadow is. The tops of the tables are lit by determining the intersection of the light volume and the tabletop surface, then drawing that shape using the same additive blend mode as before that turns the unlit pixel to the corresponding lit pixel. Then the shadows on the player. Those are drawn very differently. 
and you probably didn't even notice the effect on the player since it's so subtle and the player moves so quickly. I honestly probably wasted a lot of time trying to get this effect to work as it makes such a small difference. Um, if I knew how subtle it would be, I probably would have not done it, but it's just what I did. It's using the same technique I used in my real-time shadows video from earlier this year. And the technique works by first drawing the subject unlit. The back shadow volume is then drawn fully transparent and configured to only update the Z buffer. Next, the player is redrawn, but this time lit. Because the back of the shadow volume is drawn first, any part of the player behind it stays unlit, while anything in front is drawn lit. Now the front of the shadow volume is drawn, and the player is drawn a third time, this time unlit. Now anything behind the front shadow volume stays lit or unlit as it was before, but anything in front of the shadow volume is drawn as unlit. There are some basic optimizations I make, like if the player is fully lit or fully unlit, I just skip this process all together and draw the player once. Um, I also do a scissor box around the player when drawing the shadow volume, and that's to reduce the number of pixels I need to update, uh, because by far the biggest bottleneck when drawing on the N64 is the fill rate. Anything you can do to not process pixels that will have no effect on the final image will improve frame rate substantially. And that's it. Tomb shading and real-time shadows on N64 hardware. If you want to try the game out, there's a link in the description. It's free to download, but you can contribute anything that you want to the project. Um, the game will work just fine on real hardware, but you'll probably have a hard time getting it to work on your favorite emulator. Most of them struggle to get the tune shading effect to work. Um, it seems like Moopin 64 Plus works, but sometimes it fails to translate the grayscale frame buffer to color. And now that the jam's done, I'm going to get back to Portal 64. And I'm really excited to get back to it, so expect another update video about a month from now. Till next time.